the Aperture Users Network. We're here today to talk about color management, an important yet often overlooked topic for photographers, photo editors, graphic designers, and all sorts of visual professionals and enthusiasts. Just a short decade ago, back in the long lost world of film photography, color management was a relatively simple visual affair. It was a matter of holding up your original to the daylight and holding up a print beside it. If there was a mismatch, it was back to the darkroom to make the necessary adjustments, for the lucky most of us probably telling your lab technician to do so. All in all, a relatively simple visual affair. Well, along came computers and digital cameras with their decidedly non-visual strings of ones and zeros, their digital bits and bytes. Well, suddenly the process left the purely visual realm and became decidedly more complex. Hope, however, is not lost, as modern color management is caught up with other technological advancements, bringing color management to the masses with ease and simplicity. Today we're going to be talking about color management with the X-Rite Color Monkey, Apple's Aperture as our photographic software, and HP's line of PhotoSmart Pro printers. But really the lessons and topics we discuss can apply to anyone's color management workflow. Let's start with a bit of a briefing on color itself. The human visible light spectrum comprises just a very small portion of the overall electromagnetic spectrum, nestled somewhere between UV rays on one side and the infrared rays on the other. Now in the earlier part of last century, researchers began mapping out exactly what colors humans could discern, sampling a cross-section of gender and race to come up with an average, creating a representation of those colors and tones called lab color space. However, about 1 in 12 males and 1 in 250 females have some sort of color deficiency. Now that doesn't mean that they're actually color blind. Absolute color blindness is actually quite rare. But they have problems differentiating between two similar colors. For example, I have some trouble when it comes to certain shades of blue and purple as they approach one another. That doesn't mean that I'm color blind. I'm just merely color deficient in that area. The main point here is that not every person can discern the exact same set of colors, and as we'll discuss in depth here, neither can various input and output devices, and that's where color management really comes into play. Now you may remember from elementary school art class, or maybe a later photography class, discussions of primary and secondary colors. The primary colors include red, green, and blue, and are often referred to as additive colors, as when you combine equal parts of all three hues, you get white when projected. Secondary colors, consisting of cyan, magenta, and yellow, are often referred to as subtractive colors, as when applied to a white medium in equal parts, the combination moves towards black. Thus, colors must be subtracted to achieve white. Now the most common language of color in the digital space is what's called 8-bit RGB color, in which each color is represented by 255 levels and tones of each of the three primary colors of red, green, and blue. Altogether, they represent about 16 million different color combinations, more than adequate for all but the most discerning of color professionals. Now, unfortunately, photographers often fall into the category of most discerning of color professionals. Sometimes devices can support 12, 14, or 16-bit color. Each of the step up in so-called bit depth represents more available levels and tones per channel and thus more variety in the hues and shades of color and greater accuracy in getting color data just right. But more on that later. So we've just finished establishing how most digital devices describe color. But there's a second key component to all these numerical values. Who defines what pure red, in this case red 255, green 0, and blue 0, should look like? Should it resemble this red? Or perhaps should it resemble this red? This is where color spaces come into play. Now there's a couple of common color spaces that you should be familiar with in the 8-bit RGB realm. The first 
is sRGB, defined here in the lab space as the area within the black triangle. sRGB was created cooperatively between HP and Microsoft for use on monitors, printers, and maybe most importantly, the internet. sRGB is also a color space option on most pro DSLRs and many common consumer level digital cameras. And thus images tagged with the color space come with a preset definition of what numerical RGB value should look like. A second, less common though still widely available option is Adobe 1998 RGB. This color space was defined to more closely represent the gamut available to CMYK printers while still represented as RGB data. What this means to the end user is that Adobe 1998 RGB represents a wider gamut of color for the same numeric set of RGB data. Now in an oversimplified analogy, sRGB is the kid in grade school whose parents only bought him the 8 crayon Crayola set. Whereas the cool kid next to him, Adobe RGB 1998, at the next desk has the 16 crayon set and thus has more variance in the tone at his or her disposal. So why not always use Adobe RGB? Well, since sRGB is the most widely respected color space among varying applications, internet browsers, operating systems, and beyond, shooting sRGB color space is the best for when photos will go immediately into a wide distribution, such as posted to a website for the, all the World Wide Web to view. For the experienced photographer, however, in the event that you're still shooting JPEG, Adobe RGB is the wiser choice as the wider gamut provides your camera with more color options and you can always convert a wider Adobe RGB color space images down to the narrower sRGB color space, but not the other way around, as when the fine color data is lost in the narrow sRGB space, there's no way to regain it.